humans of the interwebs welcome to eSpot live my name is ellie joined as always by rodney he is my emotional support duck and let me tell you he has been coming in clutch <laughs> very recently just just saying it's almost new year's guys it's it's new year's eve and um all I can say is, after the year that it's been, congratulations, we're alive! That's that's actually a huge blessing, as much as I want to joke about it. Um, oh, it's been such an adventure. But yeah, I mean, for those of you who are, are watching this, uh, Happy New Year's Eve. For those of you who are watching this a little bit later, Happy New Year's. Newness is a good thing, guys. <laughs> we're just gonna go with that. Um... I don't think I have anything aside from my, uh, typical disclaimers for today, um, so, yeah, just let me know in the chat if my internet starts getting a bit wonky, and, um, let me know if anything- I'm actually very curious about the chat. I've gotten comments recently, um, that the chat might be kind of flipping out a little bit with the multi-stream, so, if there's- Oh, hello, Paige! I've got someone in the chat! Yay! Happy New Year's. Thank you so much. Rodney says Happy New Year's as well, specifically to you, Paige. So, there you go. Um, but yeah, let me know in the chat if anything seems to be going a little bit weird in it. Um, and yeah, with that, I guess we'll just kind of jump right in um, with, with entertainment news for today. Um, first up to chat about is just a little kind of fun fun thing um with the new year there's gonna be a new look for spider-man which is always fun um i mean like literally everyone else on the planet spider-man's got a had a pretty rough go of 2020 um especially after learning the true identity of the mysterious villain kindred peter parker will be looking for a fresh start along with everyone else in 2021 and for him this includes a brand new costume that looks pretty cool. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. Uh, Marvel has given fans their first glimpse of the new suit. Um, the suit was designed by X-Force cover artist Dustin Weaver and is going to make its official debut in the pages of March's The Amazing Spider-Man number 62. So you can check it out there. But if you want that sneak peek, go check it out because it's a bit different. If you look at it, the costume's quite the departure from like the stereotypical Spider-Man suit, including ditching the original colors. Not completely, but... Instead of the traditional, like, red and blue color scheme, um, it's been replaced with, like, a mix of... It's, like, blue, white, silver, and really cool glowy orange? It sounds odd, but check it out, because it looks super cool. Um, the eyes are also a major departure. That's something that's, like, typically... At least relatively consistent across the different designs, but, um... Instead of the normal eyes, there's, like, these glowing orange lenses in a background of, uh, or on top of a background of black um with a really cool design around the edges as well so it's just it's very different from what we usually see but still quintessentially spider-man um marvel hasn't yet revealed much about the origins of the new costume um aside from the fact that peter parker dons the new suit in the aftermath of sins rising that's all we really know um and that it's part of his latest confrontation with kingpin so that's that's fun Lots to learn still, so definitely looking forward to the new issue coming out. Um, also worth noting that as with past costume changes, like the St Tony Stark designed Iron Spider suit, um, and as well as Peter's own Parker Industries armored suit, um, both of which, by the way, are among the many alternative costumes that are included in Insomniac's Spider-Man game, so fun little tidbit there. Uh, this costume is going to be adding much needed tech upgrades to Spidey's usual arsenal. So, 
it's going to be super fun to see what the differences are with a specific one. Um, Weaver was quoted as saying, this design was really a collaborative effort between Nick Spencer, editor Nick Lowe, and I. Um, they raided the weirder and more techie features I was bringing and helped create something that I think is simple and both futuristic and classical. I can't wait to see Patrick Gleason's really bringing it to life. It remains to be seen if Peter is going to be wearing this new costume for out, for out? throughout or for all of 2021 or if this is kind of a temporary wardrobe change for like a specific purpose but i'm excited to find out so like i said before if you haven't seen it yet check it out if you obviously if you're a fan of spider-man um because it, it really is a fun blend of something bizarre and new but also like like i said kind of quintessentially spider-man so super super fun um and I think, I think that's like a good kind of introductory topic because we're about to dive into something a bit weird. I don't know how else to word it. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm coming up with like, as I dive into this world of, of entertainment news and gaming culture and everything else, I'm learning a lot, guys. One of the things I'm learning is there's a whole topic of information that falls under the why does this exist, but also I'm kind of glad it does. This, this is one of those things. So, ready for this. <clears throat> You've heard, there's, there's console wars is, is a thing, like, I guess. That, that's just since the dawn of time. Not really, but like the dawn of consoles being consoles. There's, there's been competition there. It's healthy, right? On a completely unrelated note, there's also, you know, fast food wars in the 21st century. It's a very common thing. Like, fast food companies competing against each other. What I did not expect to see was a combination thereof, of a fast food company joining the console wars. If you don't yet know what I'm talking about, there is now a thing called the KF console. And it, the name of it menses with my head because I want to say KFC, but then it's console, but it's KF console. <laughs> All right, so a while back, uh, KFC made a very left field announcement um, that, you know, they, they put this 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 trailer. Hey, we've got G-Man in the chat. Happy New Year's Eve. Welcome. Uh, I'm chatting about the K KF console. In case you haven't heard of it, uh, KFC has decided to make a console. Um, I think it started off as a joke. That's, that's my personal theory because it started off as like... Um, an announcement like just after the the ps5 had been unveiled um and so i thought that was a joke and i honestly think it kind of was and then fans demanded it and so now it's gonna be a real thing like this is legit guys this is a console that looks like a chicken bucket that will actually warm your chicken and this is also an important feature legitimately they put together the technology to um both keep chicken nuggets heated as well as protect the rest of the console from getting overheated <laughs> this is a thing that actually exists oh my gosh it's gonna run games at top level specs and it includes a chicken chamber <laughs> so um it was technically announced in june but like i said last week it's been officially launched Paige is saying, who does not want chicken and to play at the same time? Right? Everybody snacks while playing. Come on. Let's be real. Um, I'm a little bit weird about having things on my hands. I'm a little OCD, but that's a completely different story. So I can't even handle the idea of chicken grease on a console. <laughs> but you know what? A lot of people do life that way. And that is fine. I'm not here to judge. And I'm all for snacking while doing literally anything. So, you know, compromise. I can eat them with chopsticks or something. Anyways, that was... <laughs> that was way off topic. Um, so yeah, like, moving forward from the initial teaser, uh, the official announcement says, We're so pleased to finally give the fans exactly what they wanted, making the KF console a reality. So that's a quote from Mark Cheever, his PR and social media lead at KFC UK and Ireland. Um... The official press release goes on to say, We all know the console war is vicious, but we're very confident in the KF console as our flagship entry. Um, the console was developed um, 
in partnership with computer tech company Cooler Master. So as I said, they went all out with this. Like, it's legit. Um, so its internal cooling system was custom built to extract heat from around the outside of the chicken chamber so that the chicken itself stays hot without raising the temperature of the surrounding hardware. Um, I can't even fathom the amount of work and money that must have gone into this, but you know, it's fun. Um, according to the teaser trailer ad that they put out, the KF console features true 4K and runs games at 120 frames per second. This is a legit console. Um, Steven James, who's the global PR and influential uh, influencer manager at Cooler Master, also joined the release and said, when we were approached by KFC Gaming to make sure to make the KF console, we jumped at the chance to get involved and enter the console war. The KF console has been custom built with the gamer at the front of mind. The last thing we want is anyone to go hungry while playing. So yeah, the shape of the console intentionally resembles a bucket because, you know, fried chicken goes in a bucket. It's got a chamber for the fried chicken. I... I don't... I have so many thoughts and opinions and none of them make sense or are valid, but I just... Again, why? Why does this exist? But also, I am so grateful to live in a world where it does. You know, this alone, I think, is going to make 2021 a little bit of just a better place to, to, to live. Um, yeah, I just... Not what I thought I'd be talking about today, but I'm grateful for it, you know? And actually, connected to this, and since I've got G-Man in the chat, um, last week, I talked about Mr. Beast Burger, which is a chain opened by the uh, YouTuber, and G-Man ordered food, but we had to wrap up before we got to hear any sort of, you know, review on it. So if you're still watching, G-Man, do you have an official review on Mr. Beast Burger? Because... The people want to know. Just saying. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wait on that on that comment. Um, and probably move on to the next topic while I'm, while I'm waiting for that. Completely unrelated, though. So it's a little bit of a, a, of a bummer. Um, but yeah, I don't really have anything else to say specifically about a chicken bucket console. So... Moving right along. <clears throat> um, again, as I said when I announced the last topic, that I'm like discovering there's overarching themes in the entertainment industry, specifically in the gaming world, um, but also just elsewhere. And one of the themes is why does this exist, but I'm glad it does. And another theme is lawsuits. These are just like, I did not realize how like legally petty people could be and I just li I'm living for it I love it I love the lawsuits way more than I should it's fascinating on so many levels who knew that this is the way I'd put my criminology degree to use <laughs> oh we're not gonna go there anyways all right so Outer Banks um had the creators of Outer Banks a Netflix action adventure teen drama series have been officially sued for copyright infringement um I didn't see that coming either. So, the show was released on the streaming platform back in April, and it follows two groups of people called the Pogues and the Kooks that live in the area of North Carolina, referred to as the Outer Banks. Um, this is made up of a string of barrier islands. The Pogues soon discover a clue leading to a treasure that the group's leader's missing father has been chasing for over 20 years. Um, they fight tooth and nail against the Kooks every step of the way to reach their final goal. Cool series, a lot of drama great thing. However, according to Variety, an author named Kevin Wooten, writer of Pettywise, The Hunt for Blackbeard's Treasure, is suing the creators of the Outer Banks show, that's Josh Pate, Jonas Pate, and Shannon Burke, for copyright infringement. Wooten claims that his book and the television show are much more than coincidentally similar. He states that both stories take place in the Outer Banks, they have the same number of characters, they have them all following the same storylines, and they have the treasure hunters discovering similar clues during the treasure hunt. Interesting thought. In addition to all of that, Wooten also believes that the show creators were in North Carolina when he was there on tour promoting the book. So he's hoping to be able to prove that they had access to his material. If what he is seeking is proven true in court it's 
going to be a, a bummer for fans of this show, right? Because it's going to cut off the show with dozens of cliffhangers, unanswered plot questions, um, especially considering the fact that season two was just announced earlier this year. Um, so it's really unclear what the impact of this is going to be, if, if any, really, because the lawsuit could go any which way from here. Um, this is not the first time a Netflix show has been sued for copyright infringement. Uh, Stranger Things was previously, but that show continued on. Um, so it's possible that Outer Banks will as well. Um, this is just a topic that I, again, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, copyright is hard because stories like proving a story is original is very difficult. Now, in the case of a court of law, obviously you're innocent until proven guilty. So the, um, the, what do you call it? Burden of proof lies on prosecution as always. Um, so essentially Wooten has to absolutely prove that they stole his story. Um, otherwise the show is good to continue. Also, I'm sure Netflix has great lawyers, so there's that. But it's an interesting thought process, interesting to think about because story i don't want to say story is limited because it's not story is infinite but story is also infinitely connected um everything like i you can go through and and, and find similarities and connections and everything else in literally any um any oh sorry i'm getting distracted by the by the chat g-man saying in a lawsuit, instead of a criminal court, it's based on the preponderance of evidence rather than beyond reasonable doubt. That is true. There's different, um, uh, they're held to different standards because obviously it's a, it's a different, you're not like talking about murder, you're talking about a story. So like it, it is held to a different standard. Um, so that means as he goes on to say, um, it's gotta be more likely than not. So that is very true. Um, it's still really difficult again to do with story. However, like, it's sounding like he's got a decent chunk of evidence there, so there is that. But, uh, yeah, story is infinite, but as well as it's infinitely connected, there's, uh, anyone who's, um, kind of taken a dive into writing courses or anything like that, you've probably heard of The Hero's Journey, and that is theoretically the, um, overarching theme of pretty much every story that's written from a patriarchal perspective because there is also a heroine's journey that nobody ever talks about but that's a different story different story see what i did there anyways um there's going to be similarities there's going especially with structure and everything else tv shows are always going to have similarities because they're structured they have to tell a story in a similar way so you have to have um things going in different order we've got the john in the chat happy new year's welcome good to see you here um we're chatting about story and lawsuits right now, so welcome. <laughs> You're in luck. Um, so yeah, it'll be very, very interesting to see um, if Wooten's claims hold up in court and uh, if the lawsuit stands against Outer Banks. And as I said, like there's there's a fine line between stories being similar because they're stories, but also his evidence that it's the same storylines, the same of the same characters in the same setting. Um, that almost, that it does. It sounds like it's a little kind of too, too on the nose there. So it'll be really interesting to see how this holds up in court. Um, we're going to be following it, obviously letting you guys know if there's any fun updates in this. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, just to kind of chew on that thought process of what makes a story original. Um, what makes it original enough because stories spawn other stories and that's not necessarily a bad thing but again very different between stories spawning stories and stories stealing stories did john jump over to uh to youtube something's going on in the chat that is interesting for some reason, I can't view the multi-stream chat, which is fine because it's coming up on the screen, so it's all good. But yeah, welcome on two streaming services, John. 
Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say really about that particular copyright infringement. Um, hopefully we'll get updates because, again, lawsuits fascinate me. I'm a nerd. It's one of the ways that I'm nerdy. Hey-o. Anywho, moving right along to something a little bit, uh, lighter but still really fun. For fans of Daft Punk and or Tron, you're in luck because the 10 year anniversary, um, of the movie's release, this is the movie being Tron Legacy, is being celebrated with the release of a new version of the Tron Legacy soundtrack. This version is super cool because not only does it include the amazing soundtrack that was in the film, but it is the extended version. So the soundtrack, um, originally written and recorded by EDM duo Daft Punk, it's been newly released on Spotify and Apple Music, and it includes the full original score and nine additional tracks. So that's super, super fun. Worth noting, though, that these aren't um, never heard before tracks necessarily. A lot of these tracks have been released in separate um, avenues, if you will. Um, however, it is the first time that fans get to listen to this all together Um as it was originally written and designed to be listened to. That's always super fun. I'm also a music nerd. For those of you who don't know, I'm super into music and soundtracks and stuffs. So, um, I'm checking out John's chat real quick. I did, YouTube has a more flexible video encoder so I can view at whatever quality settings I choose. That's cool. I did not know that. The more you know. Um, sweet, nice. Um, for those of you who are still on Twitch, let me know in the chat if you all are able to see all of the chats going on. Um, because I did hear from Monday's show that there might have been some kind of strangeness going with the multi-stream. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody can see everybody else. Paige just responded saying that's awesome. So I'm assuming that y'all can chat from the two different streaming services, which is super cool. Um, so yeah. And then Paige is also saying love music. So the soundtrack is super exciting. Um, I'm a fan of Daft Punk as it is. And then also, so Tron Legacy was not a very, considered a successful release, but it's actually kind of going through a new, like people are liking it now more than they did when it was released, I suppose. Um, it surprised me when it wasn't a popular release because I enjoyed it. Uh, I love the soundtrack. The soundtrack garnered a Grammy Nom, 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 nomination, 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 Grammy nomination. There we go. Apparently, I just needed an accent. Um, so yeah, fans of music in general, fans of Daft Punk, fans of the movie, you're familiar with this. It's super exciting, like I said, to have all of these songs together as intended. Um, yeah. So, first time that all of these songs have been collected, same place, same time. Um, you know, even if it's not brand new music, I'm always welcome to any excuse to re-listen to the Tron Legacy soundtrack. Just saying. It's an uh, amazing soundtrack. Um, also, for those of you who may or may not be keeping track, uh, the Jero, Jer why can't I English all of a sudden? The Jared Leto starring Tron 3 is still currently in development with a new director, Garth Davis. So, um, that's still happening, which is super exciting. Um, if you'd like to revisit the soundtrack in movie form, or if you'd just like to see whether you're wrong about the movie a decade ago, you can also stream Tron Legacy on Disney Plus. Available now. Super fun. I am loving this. I'm having a conversation in the chat between uh, Paige and John. John coming from YouTube, Paige on Twitch. So this seems to be working. Woohoo! Cool stuff. Um, unfortunately, I'm about to interrupt the chat a little bit. Um, but continue on with this experimentation because it is, wait for it, time for our water break, which I know everybody loves just as much as I do, right? Um, for those of you who might be new, this is the part where I harp on my viewers to drink water because hydration is important and, um, as much as other beverages are delicious and awesome and sometimes bubbly and sweet and I have nothing against your drinks, 
Everybody always tries to come on here and be like, but what about chocolate milk? But what about Coke? But what about rum? Nothing against that. There's a time and place. They're all glorious things. However, your kidneys need to process water. Your body needs water. Your body will love you for it. So, drink water. And that's the end of my lecture. I'll see you guys in just a minute. Or I guess you'll see me. Either way. I switched over and the chat disappeared. Um, I saw a comment from Paige saying, I actually have water today. And I have to say, I am so proud. And Rodney approves. Paige, Rodney is proud of you. This is important. Anyways, um, moving right along to actual entertainment news. Another thing that I learned, brand new topic for me, which is super fun. Um, might be one of my favorite things. Uh, my, my second favorite thing. So my first favorite thing about um, eSpot Live is you guys. Um, and that's actually true. I love having you guys in the chat. My second favorite thing is what I get to learn about uh, the entertainment and gaming community. So, uh, today's list of things that I had no clue existed. Um, is I learned about modders. And I'm, I, I hope I'm not butchering what that is. Um, so people who modify gaming things. Um, so a modder has made a Nintendo 64 controller that not only is smaller than the original, but has uh, set a new record. Because apparently that's a thing. Um, so essentially taking an old console and making it as small as possible is apparently a well-established tradition in the modding community. Um, and it looks like there's a new victor to in the in the race specifically to shrink the Nintendo 64 as far as possible. Um, this person, G-Man Mods. G-Man, G-Man Mods. Anyways, G-Man Mods has uh, managed to cut down a Nintendo 64 to the point where it's smaller than a GameCube controller. Um, and it's really only slightly bigger than the cartridges it takes. Yes, the cartridges. It's like just, just bigger than that. Um, it's not an emulator. It's an a actual Nintendo 64 that was cut, soldered, and otherwise modder modded to fit into this handheld package. Complete with screen, battery, and controls. The joysticks are from a Nintendo Switch, chosen for their small size. Um, at three and a half inches, the screen is smaller than what you would use that be used to when playing a, an N64. The resolution is 320 by 240. Um, the shell is made up of two different plastics um, with the back being more heat resistant, which is obviously an important consideration when you're using a motherboard designed to be in a larger home console. Um, the modder is no stranger to making portable versions of the console. They've also modded it into a Game Boy Advance um, SP and inspired form factor twice now. Um, 
For this particular mod, however, they gave themselves a challenge. Don't custom design any boards. So some third party boards inside were available on an online modding shop, but they were not made specifically for this build. G-Man Mod says um, this was to be fair to the previous smallest N64 record holder. Um, made a video, they made a video showing off the project. Um, G-Man Mods admits that it's not the greatest portable Nintendo 64 experience, but that that's not really the point. Uh, the point was to make it smallest, not the greatest. Um, and they have achieved that. So, congratulations. That's awesome. But uh, they're quoted as saying, the battery life sucks. It's uncomfortable to hold, but hey, if it's in my pocket. <laughs> uh, I love that. At least they're honest, right? So, as expected with uh, the, such a small handhold, the battery only lasts about an hour and a half. But, you know, if you're looking for a fun retro experience, uh, if you're looking to, to complete a challenge, you know, success. Super fun stuff. I didn't know that this was a thing that people did. I had no clue that people had goals to just randomly make things smaller because. But I think that's super fun. Um, way over my head as far as like experience and how to's and whatnot. Gosh, that takes like gaming and engineering and a lot of computer things and knowledge and miniaturization. Why, why would that, why is that word so hard for my brain to process? I think I need updated glasses. That's, that's part of it. Cause like the first part of that word looks like ninja. Miniaturization. Anyways, fun words. Um, lots of vowels. Indeed, G-Man. All right, moving right along to a completely different topic. Um... Forbes has officially named and released the top 10 highest paid YouTubers. Because that's a thing. Um, and the highest paid YouTuber is officially nine-year-old Ryan Kaji. He's been named the highest paid YouTuber of 2020. Um, <clears throat> also worth noting, he's the highest paid YouTuber <laughs> and has been named by Forbes for the three consecutive years, so congrats to him. According to reports, the young content creator made 29.5 million USD, which is 3 million more than he made last year, and he's garnered a total of 12.2 billion views with 41.7 million users. That's a lot. That's just a lot, a lot of lot. Um, he's known for his uh, DIY science experiments, family story time, and toy unboxing videos, but he also made a majority of his earnings from licensing deals for over 5,000 Ryan World's merchandise items. The items range from bedroom decor to action figures to masks to walkie-talkies. Um, massive. They're all sold at uh, Target, Amazon, Walmart. He's got some, like, decent deals. Um, I've got someone... I've got someone new in the chat. Hello! Albright Dwarka? Is that how you say your name? I'm known for butchering names, so I apologize. But welcome! Welcome, Albright. I can say that word. <laughs> um, this is super exciting! Albright's on YouTube. Guys, I'm nerding out over the fact that it's YouTube and Twitch, and the chats are working simultaneously. Um, this is This is just super exciting. Welcome, Albright. I'm, like, getting completely distracted, which is a good thing. That's why I'm here. It's fine. Anyways, focusing. Um, people making buku bucks on YouTube is the topic that I'm currently babbling about. Um, so, yeah, we've got... Uh... Oh, Soul's here as well! Hello, Soul! Welcome! Um, this is super exciting! Yay! Thank you guys for spending your New Year's Eve with me. <laughs> um... <clears throat> So yeah, the topic, <laughs> Forbes, top 10, highest paid YouTubers. Uh, so yeah, following Kaji at uh, number two, we have Jimmy Donaldson, who's better known as Mr. Beast. hey -o! Which again, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to bring up the fact that uh, G-Man needs to give us an update on how the burgers were for Mr. Beast Burgers, because why not? Um, <clears throat> 
So Mr. Beast earned 24 million USD from his stunt videos and merchandise line. Um, next up is the five man group Dude Perfect with 23 million. Uh, numbers four, five, and six are Rhett and Link with 20 million. Markiplier with 19.5 million. Preston Arsman with 19 million. Um, number seven, we get six year old Nastia, who is both the youngest and the only woman to make the list. Um, she made 18.5 million USD. And then we've got Blippi, David Dobrik, and Jeffrey Starr closing out the top 10 with 17 million, 15.5 million, and 15 million respectively. That is a lot of millions to make on YouTube. Um... Now that, now that I'm streaming on YouTube. Yeah, right. Um, super fun stuff, though. Uh, fascinating. I kind of... I, I really adore the fact that the top earner is nine years old and another of the top earners is, is six years old. Um, media and the ability to make and market media privately that's, like, brand new over the past you know, decade or so, but it's just like the, the way that we make and create and consume content is just constantly shifting. And um, as bizarre and way out of my mental capacity as these numbers are to process um, money-wise, it's, it's fascinating to me and I think a positive thing that um, this is even possible. Um, oh, we've got a Jedi Roxy in the chat. Hey, welcome. Welcome, Jedi Roxy. Um, <clears throat> this is super exciting because it appears the chat is working. Um, G Man's back. Jedi Roxy's here. Woohoo! I was nervous about the chat. Had some problems with it before. So, yay. Yay, chat. Um, yay, content. That's all I really have on that particular topic. It's just kind of a fun top 10. Um, maybe a little bit unexpected if you, you know, were not anticipating a nine year old making almost 30 million dollars on youtube but again also important to note that some of that earnings was from merchandise so hey um <clears throat> g-man says it's the chalky milk person yes jedi roxy is the chalky milk person um <laughs> also g-man i feel like you're avoiding this i still want to know how the mr beast burgers was um when I when I announced that Mr. Beast Burgers was a thing that exists, Jimin ordered some, and the the video ended before we got to talk about whether it was good. Oh, there it goes! Wow, there there we goes. Uh, oh my gosh, it was delicious. Some of the best fast food ever. Does this make this a commercial? <laughs> Do I get royalties now? <laughs> um. Just don't get the pickles on the fries. It makes them kind of soggy. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That is solid advice. Um, unless you like soggy fries, which sounds like it's sarcasm, but I don't like... S I do kind of like soggy fries a little bit. Is that weird? Is that weird? That's weird, isn't it? I like soggy fries. I don't know if I would like, like, pickle juice soggy fries, but I like, like, yeah, when they're cooked and they're a little bit... So like, I either like them crunchy... Like, solidly, solidly crunchy or super soggy. I don't really like the in-between of the just kind of regular fry. Um, that was weird information that y'all didn't need to know. And now I feel like I'm a, I'm a little bit of a strange person for admitting to uh, the internet world that I enjoy soggy fries. But hey, you know, it's fine. I'm going to move on to an entertainment news topic. Because that's why you're actually here. Um, in... What is probably sad news for some people, um, ESPN has at, uh, officially confirmed the shutdown of the esports editorial operations. Um, from a business perspective, this is sad because this is going to impact um, quite a few people uh, from just like that work perspective. So, diving in a little bit. Um, ESPN esports will be shutting down its entire esports division, notwithstanding work that's already been filed. The division will no longer be publishing any new news or articles. Uh, it's going to see its social media accounts go dark in the days ahead. 
Um, esports, ESPN Esports was unable to escape the latest round of layoffs that the company um, announced last week. That saw writers Tyler Erzberger and Emily Rand announce their departure, as well as editor Sean Morrison and video producer Thomas Tischio. Esports journalist Jacob Wolf earlier announced that he would not be returning after his contract expired in January, and senior editor Darren Kulinski abruptly announced his resignation last week. Um, so, lots of layoffs going on. Um, an ESPN spokesperson told the Esports Observer, We've made the difficult decision to cease operations for our dedicated daily esports editorial and content. We recognize esports as an opportunity to expand our audience and will continue to do so through coverage from the broader team for major events, breaking news, and coverage. Um, last Thursday, ESPN announced that it was eliminating approximately 500 jobs. This is about 10% of its current workforce to weather the COVID storm. Um, and this was released according to Jimmy Pitaro, who is ESPN's chairman. Um, of the 500 jobs, 300 positions are layoffs, with the other 200 being um, positions that were unfilled that will just remain vacant. Um, however, the esports division was already seeing some um, line item budget cuts in areas such as freelance. Writers were told that the division would be using syndicated content from Rooters for the majority of its news coverage. Um, the travel budget tightened. New writers were signed at like much lower salaries than previously seen. Um, and then as the year progressed and talk was, you know, starting about a strategy that would see ESPN focus more resources on a direct to consumer strategy, uh, rumors began circulating that ESPN Esports was looking to pivot to a similar strategy. Um, but then as Reuters filled in a lot of the editorial content for the outlet, a notable change took place that saw a number of shows developed for ESPN's Esports audience on Twitch, but the shows were not really delivering the traffic. Um, the shows all ran from November 15th of 2019 to November 10th of 2020, and only 25 of the 288 drew more than 1,000 viewers, according to TwitchTracker.com. Um, the ESPN Rocket League Invitational Tournament streams from July 24th to 26th saw more than 15,000 viewers log in and watch each day. Um, so combined, these events had industry professionals believing that ESPN would be moving towards producing and facilitating esports events of its own, uh, much like the re relationship ESPN already has with X Games. Um, ESPN has in fact produced and broadcast esports events such as Overwalks and Rocket League, as well as League of Legends, which aired on ESPN 2 last April. Um, moving forward, ESPN has secured rights for various events on an event by event basis with an upcoming broadcast slate that includes NBA 2K, V10 R League, F1 Esports, and more. Um, but ESPN Esports itself as a department is gun kibbutz. Um, so that's all I have on that particular topic. Um, moving on to the chat, which I think is much more important and interesting. Um, John says, nah, saggy fries are slept on. They're good when they're really warm and well salted. That's it. That's the, the, the warm and salty soggy. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Apparently I'm not quite a complete freak. So that's good to know. And, um, Sol says fried pickle chips are awesome. That's true, too. Does, uh, Mr. Beast's burgers have fried pickle chips? Because maybe if they were fried pickle chips on top of the fries, they wouldn't make the fries as soggy. Just the thought. Again, I'm pitching all these ideas. I should get paid for this. I'm kidding. Um, only a little bit. So, yeah. That's all I have to say about ESPN. I have one more topic to chat about. Um... And this is a topic that I talked about on one of my first um, eSpot live shows that I did. Um, but I feel like it's going to keep coming up as as things as things go. Um, Jedi Roxy saying in the chat, same with the soggy fries that are warm and salty. That and overcooked crunchy fries. Those are literally the only types of fries that I like. The, the warm, salty... Like, just fresh soggy fries, and then the overcooked crunchy ones. And just the regular fries don't interest me. But for some reason, those two extremes just make the best fries. Um, 
Jedi Roxy's like four years behind on the chat. That's impressive, because I haven't even been around for four years. I mean, obviously I have. Hold on. That sounded weird. Anyways. I just appeared out of, like, the ether. And now I exist. That's why I can't human very well. Um, and g -Man likes warm, salty, crunchy fries. Okay, that's fair. Warm, salty, crunchy fries. I like that. Um, focusing on the actual news topic I'm meant to be talking about. Um, so there's been a, another study published by Cyber Psychology, Behavior, and Social Networking. This study is a 10-year study that has officially shown no result um, of a significant link between children that play violent video games and those that experience increased aggression in adolescence. So once again, we have yet another study that is showing that video games do not make people violent. What? I am shocked. Um, who knew? So this has been going on a lot. Like, this has been a conversation since video games began. But, like, frankly, this has been a conversation since before video games began. Like, there's always, I feel like... And it's, it's, it's typically an older generation looking at the younger generation and new technology and be like, this new technology is making you violent. And this goes back to, like, novels in the 1800s where they were making women feisty and stuff like that. Like, this is, these are, this is conversations that have been happening for, like, since the dawn of time. Um, however, yet another scientific study um, has shown that there's no correlation between playing video games as a child and increased aggression in adolescence. Um, this study will hopefully maybe have a little bit more clout than some of previous studies because of its longevity. So the study has is unique in that it's a 10 year study that has followed a focus group of 500 participants with an average current age of 14. Um, so they've been like following kids and, and, and doing this for, for years, which is a good thing. It, you know, extends the impact of the study. Um, and it, Measured impact of games like Grand Theft Audio, Auto, Audio, <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, which is used, I feel like, as a common example of like this violent video game for those youngsters. That I have no clue what just happened with my voice right there. That was a very weird thing. I apologize. Anyways, um, so those that played the violent video games over many hours as teens did not see a noticeable increase in aggression as adolescents when compared with those. Um, that played over fewer hours. So, instead, the research shows that some of the children may have actually used the game as a way of dealing with feelings of anxiety. What? Using media as, like, a coping mechanism that can potentially be healthy? Who knew? Anyways, um, participants in this study were given questionnaires to fill out, uh, to analyze levels of aggression. And according to the study, three natural groups emerged. So there was one group that played aggressive games the most as kids, but then kind of tapered off as they got older. There was a second group that played a moderate amount to start with, but then increased as they got older. And finally, the third group started with very little time um, and increased as they got older. So one started with a lot, decreased. One started kind of like medium and increased and one started uh with very little and increased um the results showed absolutely no difference between groups one and three while group two seemed to display the highest level of aggression um but then again it's showing that you know some of these kids are using this as an outlet for that um studies about the impact of violent video games on players have been uh conducted countless times over the years the results have consistently been the same, that there is no correlation. This particular study doesn't necessarily have that control group. Um, and that's that's also kind of really important for, for any kind of long-term study like this. Um, but yeah, there's just, like I said, I think the assumption that they, that video games can cause aggression it comes from that same pattern of, um, I guess, a generational disconnect, if you will. There will always be different technology in the following generation than there was in the generation before. And there will always be lingering t suspicion of that new technology. Um, so we are actually seeing as time goes on that video games are being more and more accepted and that this argument is kind of decreasing a little bit, but it's still very much there where people are claiming that video games make you violent. Yet another study 
officially showing that that's not necessarily the case. Um, uh, video games are just kind of treated as that scapegoat for various societal ills. Um, and often, like, they're used as, as, like, other things are ignored if video games can be blamed. Um, so here's to hoping that with this as an official psychological study that's been published, um, maybe we'll be able to kind of move on to slightly different, you know, studying things that actually, like, actually matter. <laughs> Not... Aggression matters, and studying aggression is important because, you know, we want a functioning society and all that, but, like, hopefully, like I said, the more that these studies happen, maybe people will actually start listening and stuff. You know, you can always hope. So there it is. Yet again, we've discovered that video games do not cause aggression. I'm gonna catch up on the chat real quick. Uh, Jedaroxy, out of the ether and into eSpot. I feel like that should be my tagline. It's true. Um, and G-Man saying, I feel like this is redo of the debate from, like, 1995. Like I said, this, this debate has been going on for ever. And before it was video games, it was novels. Before it was novels, I'm sure it was something else. Um, I feel like the ancient Egyptians probably had something like these young people and their... wheels. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> that... <laughs> I have no excuse for that. I'm sorry. I don't even know what happened. All right. Um, <laughs> before I dig myself into this hole that I cannot dig my way out of, um, that's all I have on news topics for, for this day. I was going to say week, but I do this twice a week. So for Thursday, um, <clears throat> So yeah, that's all I really have. From all of us here at DVSI Entertainment, um, a broken record, but like, I'll always say thank you for your support. Thank you so much. Um, Soul's asking, New Year's resolutions. Ooh, that's a good question. I don't really have any. Frankly, I'm just, I want to live. I'm proud of myself. I survived this year, guys. Um, I survived this year and I'm kind of proud of myself for that. Um, <clears throat> oh, oh G-Man. Wow. Yeah. Okay. G-Man says having a devious new year. Of course. I feel like I have failed as a representative of devious I entertainment. So thanks. Uh, but yeah, so that's, there we go. Having a devious new year. Um, <clears throat> does anybody else have any specific like resolutions? Actually. Okay. So I do kind of have, I don't know if I can call it a resolution, but I have a plans um, that I would like to do. Um, been toying around with the idea of, uh, doing some, some, playing some video games for you guys. And so I'll, I'll dive into that in a little bit more detail in the future as I kind of get things together for that. But I definitely want y'all's opinions on, um, if you'd be interested in watching me butcher my way through attempting to learn how to video game. And, um, what video games you would like to see me attempt, if that's the case. So, this isn't necessarily an official poll yet, but there will be one. Um. <laughs> wheels make you stupid, Ellie quotes of 2021. I didn't say wheels make you stupid. I don't think. I didn't say that, did I? Wait, what did I even say? Um. I insinuated that, like, the new generation of Egyptians created wheels, which is not the case, because wheels have been around for quite a bit longer than that, so I said something kind of stupid, but, um, anyways. <clears throat> I'm just continuing to dig this hole. I'm so good at that. Um, but yeah, so, from everybody at DVSI Entertainment, um, have a happy and prosperous 2021. We are so excited for this new year. Um, we're so grateful for your support and we are looking forward to um, just all the things we have in store. If you're not already, please be sure that you're sh you follow us across social media. So we're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and Twitch and uh, Discord. We're on Discord. We've got a community building there as well. Check us out um, because we have some really, really exciting plans for 2021, guys. Like... Things are getting big. This is just the beginning for DBSI Entertainment. And um, 
we're looking forward to sharing a whole bunch of stuff with you. So please follow us just so you can see everything that we have planned for this next year as we announce them. Um, and of course, I'll announce them here as well. But, you know, follow us anyways. Um, thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you so much for watching and for commenting and for all these things. Um, a Spot Live exists solely for this purpose. Um, we have a show called eSpot that's on YouTube. Check it out if you haven't already. They're a bit more organized in presenting entertainment news, so it's kind of similar, kind of different. You'll still get new info from me. I'm not trying to, like, tell you not to watch. But the reason we're doing eSpot Live is to build this community and to have this connection with you guys because we want your feedback. We want you guys involved. We have such excited things planned. Um... If you have not already checked out Awoken, Awoken Chapter 1 of Reverie is available on Steam. It's in its early access release right now. And um, we're just kind of throwing out major updates as we go that we're super, super excited about. It's getting completely revamped. Um, we've been listening to feedback and really excited about it. And um, we have, like I said, major plans for 2021. We've got new games we're releasing. We've got updates we're releasing, and we've still got um, the full version of Awoken planned for release much later in the year. Um, so yeah, if you have not already checked it out, please, please check out Awoken on Steam. If you have checked it out and we're kind of like, I'm not sure what's going on here, check it out again. Because like I said, we're throwing out updates. Our devs are working overtime over the holidays. We're really working on making this the best experience we can for you. Um, and we're super proud of what we're coming up with. So thank you guys who have supported us. And um, yeah, thank you for your continued support. I'm going to see you guys, or I guess you will see me on Monday for our first episode of the brand spanking new year. And um, in the meantime, just have a happy New Year's. Have a safe New Year's Eve. Um, yeah, stay stay safe and happy and healthy. And I appreciate y'all more than I can say. And of course, of course, of course, don't forget to stay devious. I will be back on Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. if you're on the other coast. And um, have an awesome holiday. Stay devious. <laughs>